that we'll be traveling throughout the summer. All right, back to John chapter number 13 with me, if you would. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says here, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Now let's stop here just for a second before we get into uh, the meat of the story here and be reminded once again what is taking place. Jesus is in Jerusalem. It's the last week leading up to the crucifixion. We've already seen a number of things take place. And the last thing we talked about uh, Sunday, last Sunday, was how that he had sent two of his disciples, Peter and John, to go find a room for them where they could celebrate or observe the Passover. And remember, they went and they followed someone who had a, a, wa a basin of water. They followed that person to a home. Then they knocked on the, the door of the home, talked to the master of the house, told the master of the house that Jesus had need of a room in the house, and the master of the house took them to the up, to an upper room, that a large upper room that was already furnished. And so Peter and John prepare everything, and now here we find in John chapter number 13 a story that only John records. And remember once again, we've seen this on more than one occasion, that uh, John recorded some stories that Matthew, Mark, and Luke did not record. Uh, we don't know exactly why the Lord impressed upon John's heart to write about these, or why these stuck out to John, but it's it, there's a pretty good uh, a pretty good thought behind it is that maybe because uh, John was known as the disciple that Jesus loved, and he he looked at things a little bit differently than Matthew, Mark, and Luke did, and so he records a story uh, that takes place during the Passover. Look at verse number two now. They're there in the upper room, and the Bible says, "And supper being ended." The devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Talking about Jesus. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. So John tells us that the supper had ended. And we aren't actually told by John about the Lord's Supper. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all record uh, what took place and the words that the Lord spoke concerning the bread and concerning uh, the juice. But John doesn't. He records what happened afterwards, which actually is pretty interesting because this story is going to teach us something very important here as we read on. Verse number 4, let's look at it once again. He riseth from supper and laid aside his garments, talking about his outer robe, all right, and took a towel and girded himself. He got a towel ready. He put it on maybe his arm or on his shoulder. And then the Bible tells us in verse number 6, excuse me, verse number 5, after that he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wiped them with the towel wherewith he was girded. He went and he found the, the basin of water, he poured water into a bowl, and then he took that uh, uh, bowl and he went and he began to wash the disciples' feet one at a time. He then would dry their feet off, and, and we have all the disciples sitting here, all twelve, including Judas Iscariot, and not one of them says a word to Jesus as he does this, except Simon Peter. Verse number 6, we already read it, but let's look at it again. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered, answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. That should be a clue to us that there was a meaning behind what Jesus was doing here. It was more than simply washing of the feet, outwardly or physically speaking. If he tells Peter, Peter, you're not, you don't understand what I'm doing, but you'll understand it later on, that there had to be a meaning behind what he was doing. There had to be some type of a, a lesson there. Verse 8, Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Peter uh, makes a very uh, bold statement here. You're not going to wash my feet. Of course, remember, washing of the feet was a very humbling thing. It was something that a servant would do. And Peter looked at Jesus as his Lord and his Master, as Jesus will later on refer to in verse number 13. And he didn't want his Lord or his Master to bow down to him and to wash his feet. And so he says, you're never going to wash my feet. Verse number 9. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus tells him, Peter, if you don't let me wash your feet, 
you don't have a part with me. In other words, you don't have any correlation with me. You don't. You can't have fellowship with me. And I love how Peter goes from one extreme to the other, like most of us probably do at times. Nope, you're not going to wash my feet, Jesus. Well, if you don't let me wash your, your feet, you're not going to have any fellowship with me. We're not going to uh, be in unity. Oh, okay, well, then you can wash my feet, but not just my feet. Wash my hands. Wash my head as well. Wash all of me. Verse number 10, Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? He goes ahead and he tells Peter, Peter, I don't need to wash your hands and your head. I only need to wash your feet. And he finishes washing Peter's feet and drying them off. And then he goes and he sits down. And in his statement to Peter about not needing to wash anything but his feet, he told Peter, he said, ye, in verse 10, ye are clean, but not all. Because he knew that there was one that was sitting there that was not clean. He knew Judas Iscariot was there, and Judas was going to betray him. And so then he sits down, and he asks the question in verse number 12, which I'm sure they were waiting for him to ask, know ye what I have done to you? In other words, do you know why I just did this? He had told Peter earlier, you're not going to know what I'm doing, or you're not going to understand why I'm doing what I'm doing until later on. And so he gets done cleaning all their feet. He sits down, and then he asks them, do you know why I did this? And, of course, there is no answer there, which would leave us to believe that all the disciples just stood or sat there thinking to themselves, I have no idea how to answer this question. I don't know why Jesus washed my feet. Because remember as well that, they didn't wash their feet after supper. Whenever they came into the home, that's when they washed their feet. So for Jesus to do this after they had already come into this man's house, gone up to the upper room and made themselves at home and, and had eaten there, uh, to wash their feet after all of this transpired was, was peculiar. It was odd. And so they had no answer. So Jesus tells them in verse number 13, Ye call me Master and Lord. And ye say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. I'm so glad that the Lord there wasn't meaning physically. That he wasn't saying to his disciples, all right, from here on out, I want you guys to go get a basin of water, and I want you to get a towel, and I want you to wash people's feet. There's some people's feet in here this morning I probably would not want to touch. And trust me, you probably would not want to trust my, trust, or touch my feet either. Trust me. I'm so glad that he, he had a purpose behind what he was saying. But once again, it was more than just a physical aspect. It wasn't, hey, I want you to start going around house to house, knock on people's doors and ask if you can wash their feet. No, he had a, a thought in mind. And it was something a little deeper than that. Look at verse number 16. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. In my Bible, I have that verse underlined. It's so important whenever the Lord talked about happiness. Uh, I, I, I figured it was important enough to underline. Happiness, of course, is an emotion. It's different than joy. I don't know about you this morning, but I want to be happy. I have the joy of the Lord. We talked about the joy of the Lord as our strength the other night in the service. But I want to be a happy Christian as well, not just a joyous Christian. I want to be happy outwardly. And he says, hey, if you know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Now, with all that in mind, let's try to understand what principle Jesus was teaching here in this story. As we said, he got up and he went and he washed their feet. Peter wouldn't allow him. He said, you're not going to do it. He says, if you don't let me do it, you'll have no part with me. In other words, you'll have no fellowship with me. This was supposed to be an illustration that when we want to fellowship with God, we have to make sure that we are clean. Jesus went on because, remember, Peter said, he says, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. He says, hey, 
And imagine Peter sitting there and he has his feet there and Jesus is washing his feet. Imagine him saying, what? I can't have fellowship with you unless you wash my feet. Well, then, here, here's my hands. And oh, by the way, here, here's my head. Wash all of me. And Jesus responded to him by saying, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet. Now, of course, I don't speak Greek this morning. You don't speak Greek. But the New Testament was written in Greek. And in the Greek language, there were two different words used here in verse number 10 where it says, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet. When it says, He that is washed, the word used for washed in the Greek is a word that means to bathe. He who has bathed. Now, in Jesus' time, the uh, person, if they wanted to bathe, of course, remember, they didn't have indoor plumbing like you and I did. They didn't step inside the shower and turn on the faucet and, and clean themselves. They'd have to go down to a bathing area. Remember back in the book of uh, Exodus how Pharaoh's daughter went down to the river for what? To bathe. That's what she did. They had areas for the people where they could go and bathe and bathe privately. And so he was when he was talking about being bathed, he was talking about being cleansed fully from head to toe. He said, if you've been washed from head to toe, then there's no need for you to be cleansed except for your feet. That second word that's used in the Greek literally means to, to wash, uh, and it's talking about a certain part of the body. And here, Jesus says the feet. Now, when someone would go and bathe down in the river, those of you that have ever been swimming understand this. You get out of the river, you're clean. Well, if it's a clean river, hopefully you're clean. You get out of the river and you're clean. You walk up on the ground, maybe you la uh, latch on your sandals and you walk home. And you get home and you walk in the door and you're clean, right? Because you just got out of the river. You just bathed, except for one part of you, your feet. Because yeah. as you were walking, your feet were wet. And everywhere you stepped, something stuck to your feet. If you walked on sand, sand stuck to your feet. If you walked through mud, mud stuck to your feet. And so your feet were in need of cleansing, were in need of washing. And as we already said, that's why they would have these pitchers of water in these basins where people could put water in them and, and wash their feet when they got home. Now, a person had already been cleansed from head to toe when they stepped out of that river or out of that body of water. But the trip home, or on the trip home, they would get dirty. In fact, during Jesus' time, they would throw their, their uh, trash and, and, and things out in the street to the point where it wasn't just the elements of the earth that would dirty their feet, but it would be the trash uh, of their neighbors and of those in the city that they might have to walk past or even step in. Once again, any of you that go to a supermarket or, or to a, a Walmart or a Target know you are got to go into one of those stores and you're probably going to step on someone's litter, someone's piece of paper, or if you're really unlucky, on someone's piece of bubble gum that they just decided to throw out there on the concrete. And that's what was happening in Jesus' day. People would go down, they would get bathed, they would be bathed from head to toe, and then on their journey home, they, their feet would get dirty. And so this was an illustration. Jesus was illustrating to his disciples, hey, once you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you get washed thoroughly. You're washed by the blood. You are cleansed. You're on your way to heaven. Your sins in the past, they're forgiven. They're under the blood. Hey, your past, present, and future sins are all forgiven. When Jesus looks at your heart, uh, and when God, has, uh, the Father, looks at your heart, He doesn't see your sins anymore. He sees a clean heart thanks to the blood of Jesus Christ. But as you and I are on that journey home, our feet get dirty. As we are living in the muck and mire of the world, and we are constantly bombarded by the things of the world, our feet get dirty. And so Jesus was trying to illustrate to His disciples that if you want to have fellowship with me, you have to make sure your feet are clean. In other words, you have to make sure that you cleanse yourself, not your heart. Your heart's already been taken care of, but that you cleanse yourself so that you can have that relationship. Turn over to Psalm 119 and verse number 9 real quickly. Psalm 119 and verse number 9, uh, I have a few verses I want to share with you, and they're not new verses. You've heard them before. Psalm 119 and verse number 9, the Bible says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. 
What did uh, the psalmist say here in Psalm 119 later on? He says, that Thy word have I hid in mine heart, verse number 11, that I might not sin against Thee. The Word of God is what's going to lead, guide, and direct us and help us have a way that is cleansed. Help us have a life that is cleansed. Help us live in a way that honors and pleases God. Back in the book of John, a few chapters after where we read in John chapter number 15, in verse number 3, Jesus is uh, speaking here and He says in John 15, 3, now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. The word of God cleanses us, and the word of God directs us. And we know that there are times, as I said, where we get away from the word of God, and we get away from uh, living the way that God would want us to live. And what ends up happening? The, uh, the dirt of the world begins to stick to us. And we have to get it cleansed. We have to get it washed off. We have to make sure that we, uh, we uh, are clean so we can have that right relationship with God. Over in Ephesians chapter number 5, verses 25 and 26, Paul, when he's giving instruction to the Ephesians, and specifically to the husbands and the wives in the church there in Ephesus, he says in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. In 1 John 1, 9, a verse that we probably all can quote, the Bible says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This morning, what we need to understand is that Jesus was trying to teach His disciples that each and every day, each and every time you go out into the world, and part of the world begins to stick to you, and it begins to defile you. If you want to have that relationship with God, that right relationship, you have to stop and pray and ask God to cleanse you from that, to wash that off you, to help get it away from you. And then you need to make sure that you take the Word of God with you so that you can stay clean throughout the day, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing. The Bible says in verse number 17, back in our text, John chapter number 13, once again, if ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Remember back in the book of Proverbs, uh, Proverbs chapter number, I believe it's 19 and verse number 28. I might have my, my reference wrong there. Let me look here real quickly. The Bible says, uh, yep, I have the wrong reference. Maybe it's Proverbs 29 verse 18. I, I have the reference all Confused. Yeah, Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. If we want to be happy Christians and we want to have that, that right relationship with God, we're going to have to make sure that we are have clean feet. I was reading what J. Vernon McGee said. J. Vernon McGee had a program on the radio for the longest time, and it's still uh, on some radio stations called Through the Bible. And he said, we wonder why we don't have revival in our churches anymore. He said, we have people that doc they know doctrine up here, and their heart's been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. He said, but the problem is they've got stinky feet. He said, they are walking in the world, and they're not cleaning their feet off. And uh, I was talking to my wife about it. I said, when you think about it, outside of body odor, feet, that can probably be the stinkiest thing on a person. Man, people, you take off your shoes, you have stinky feet. People can smell it on the other side of the room, it seems like. And you know what? So, there are too many Christians that have, spiritually speaking, stinky feet this morning because they're walking in the mire and the filth of the world, and they're being defiled by it, and they're not getting that washed off. And then they're coming to the house of God and they're saying, well, all right, God, I'm, I'm ready to hear from you. I'm, I'm ready to worship you and praise you. And God looks and he says, what? You're dirty. No, maybe not your whole body is dirty. You've been saved, but you've been out there walking in the world. You've been defiling yourself with the things of the world, with the sins of the flesh. And he looks at it in his eyes, in, in his nostrils. It stinks. We need to make sure as Christians that we don't stink in God's sight. That God isn't repulsed 
by our smell, but that we daily, and if need be, hourly, go to Him and say, Lord, forgive me and help me. And once again, that we take His Word. And once again, I know maybe not everybody can carry a copy of the, the Bible with them, although with cell phones anymore, you pretty much can carry it with you. We need to carry it right here in our hearts. We need to carry it right here in our minds so that when we are tempted and we are tested, it doesn't matter if the battery on my phone's working or not. If I know that Scripture, if I know the Word of God, it will keep me from making mistakes. It will keep me from walking in the way of the world. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for all that you've given to us. Lord, I pray that you'd help us this morning to understand how important it is that we do separate ourselves and that daily we cleanse ourselves